Hello and welcome to Beneath the Surface. Thank you for joining us today. Paul Morano here with my very special guest, Father Anthony Blunts from Most Holy Redeemer Parish in Detroit, Michigan. Father Anthony, how are you today? Oh, I'm good, Paul. How are you doing? Fabulous. Fabulous. Uh, today, we are going to um, embark on number 15 of our series, The Creed Beneath the Surface. And we began the creed uh, all the way one line at a time. And this is our 15th installment called uh, He Will Come Again in Glory to Judge the Living and the Dead and His Kingdom Will Have No End. And that is the line that we are going to focus on tonight. It is all about Jesus as judge and what this all means. And um, if you want to uh, listen to all the other installments of the creed beneath the surface, just go to my webpage, palmerano.com or better yet, my YouTube page, uh, which should be displayed right now for you. So, Father Tony, you ready to delve? <laughs> yes, I think so. All right. <laughs> You're a pretty deep diver. That's the only thing I can say about that, but uh, I'm ready to go. All right, put your scuba, scuba stuff on. Here we go. All right, so Father Anthony, we are, as you as we said, we are delving into the, uh, the uh, that line of the creed relating to Jesus as judge. Tell me this. The church teaches that there are two judgments. Uh, one is the particular judgment. The other is the general judgment. The particular judgment happens at the moment of death when the soul becomes face to face with God. And, um, and the general judgment, of course, is on the last day when Christ comes back again. The dead will be raised. It's, it's a more of a public thing. Now, my question to you is, why is this part of the creed, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead? That refers to the general judgment, I assume. Why is that called a judgment if the souls in heaven are already judged? Shouldn't it be more called, say, a public manifestation of the truth? Well, that is a fascinating thing um, with the church. So there is a particular judgment. Um, and it's a fascinating thing, this two judgment thing, that there should be such a such a reality. I mean, I, hmm. I suppose it points to the fact of what it means to be human. You know, that, uh, you know, each person's life is uh, so important. And yet, there's, we don't believe in this individualism, which is a very big thing these days. Yeah. Uh, my life is completely intertwined with every other life that has ever been lived. What a shocking thing, you know. And that was a big thought, by the way, just to mention this, and the fathers of the church. One of the yeah. great one of the great themes of the Father of the Church was the solidarity of the human race. Right. Uh, in Adam and then in Christ. So uh, the particular judgment, you know, every person, the moment of their are leaving this world. And we, we have to ponder this rather deeply, Paul, the, the, the reality of that judgment. <laughs> you know, this is yeah. where judgment in general, we, we have to ponder it. And, and, I often tell people this, when I talk to them about the final judgment of human beings, you know, speaking about the four last things. Yep. And it's always, it is important from time to time for people, and maybe even, you know, frequently, even more than that, to go over the four last things. Uh, death, judgment, Church. heaven, and hell. Yep. But we need to go over those four last things. Yeah. Um, but I want to say, though, that it's not a morbid exercise to go over things like death and judgment. It well, sounds more, it sounds, of course, morbid means death, but it sounds uh, horrible or something it might to people. But I, I would say this is not the case. I mean, there's certain things. One reason is this. The fact that I am judged, I always tell people, yeah. uh, judgment means that my life has meaning. Because if my life didn't have meaning, uh, there would it wouldn't be happening. My life is so important, so wonderful mm. and meaningful that it needs to be judged. So I always tell people, your cat will not be judged. Well, and let why me is that you know. Let, let me just delve a little beneath the surface on that. So we, as human beings made in God's image, we have we we, we can distinguish between being and becoming. Our being is. Is, is is has infinite worth because we are we are you know god's image and likeness we have that intellect and will we have a spiritual quality we will live forever 
Um, so, and that's why we respect all human beings, even our enemies. We're, we're called to love our enemies because of their being. Now, we also, of course, have that dimension of becoming because we have free will and we have to live our, out our lives and we, we carve out and create for ourselves a character, a personality and a, an openness to love and to God. And it seems like we're not being judged for our being because that's already good. God created us in his image. We're being judged for our becoming, how we decided, how we chose to live our lives and those choices vis-a-vis -vis our relationship with God and with others, yes? Yes, I mean, right. There's something uh, amazing about that, what you just said, how human, well, John Paul II put it this way. He says that every human being has to create their own, he called it their ethical essence. Yeah. So yeah, our being is something we receive uh, but our ethical essence, in other words, as you put it, my character to some extent, you know, right. Um, I'm the amazing thing is I am responsible for that. Right. And as somebody once said, a great man once said, the only real tragedy in life, uh, the only real failure is not to have become a saint. Yeah. Now that makes a lot of sense. Now, the, I, I think there is a um, a danger here um, when you when you you don't have that proper balance between being and becoming because there are a lot of philosophers as you know some some are called existentialists who believe that we can become anything we want uh, whatever we choose uh, and of course uh, some outgrowths of this now we see in our society today are, are silly things like transgenderism that we can become another sex if we so decide to do so. Uh, and, and we can, you know, we can shatter all the boundaries, shatter all the boundaries that, you know, traditional morality has, has, has understood human nature contains because we can become anything we want. Now, I just want you to, to say a little, a little something about this notion of human nature and natural law. And even though we are becoming vis-a-vis uh, -vis our choices, there is a certain definition of becoming that we can't go past. Does that make sense? Well, I would put it this way. It has to do with, uh, you could put it this way, that hmm. I'm human flourishing. It has a better way to put it. I'm almost yeah. a flower. as you know, and as, I want to flourish as what God made me to be. And uh, that's very wonderful indeed. Yeah. And you know, we could talk about all kinds of things, Paul. There's so much to go over here. But I would say, just to jump around a little bit, jump yeah. up, that we want to, what does it mean? I mean, ultimately, what does it mean for me to flourish as a man, as a human being in God's right. image and likeness? And yes, I can look at different things to tell me, but the greatest reality, of course, the, the, so amazing, is what Christmas is about right now. We're celebrating the season of Christmas right now, yes. January 2nd. Um, so the whole point of... God becomes one of us, and in that man, Jesus, I see what it means to be human. What, what a flourishing, fulfilled life really means. Yes, this is the question yeah. of life. Uh, and I want, I want, so following Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit, following my, mm. my in that, okay, if I, if I do that and become yeah. a disciple of Jesus Christ with all my heart, the, the beautiful thought is I will become what I was meant to be. And of course, uh, the teachings of the church, which are a, literally a, an extension of Christ on earth, because obviously Jesus was a celibate and, and there are a lot of people who are married and who are called to marriage. So, so Jesus Christ, not only in his life, which we see in the gospels, but in his truth, in his being through the church and the, the sacred doctrines, doctrines that uh, the church teaches in his name that are uh, kept from error by the Holy Spirit. We can we can look at that too as this is how to live a fulfilling life. Right. Well, the church, you know, the church is uh, the. You know, how could you put it? In one way you can say, what the church does, of course, is she. You know, she is cre the Holy Church is creating disciples of Jesus because yeah. she is His body on earth. She's creating them, and that's what her teaching is all about. To lead us on the path, this beautiful, glorious path that Christ laid out for us, it goes straight to joy in yes. this life and the next. There's no other path that leads to heaven. So, so by, I'm sorry. So by our choices, 
we can, and, and this is uh, obviously the, 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 what should be for forefront and the, the forefront of everybody's mind, we can choose our eternal destiny, eternal happiness and joy with God or eternal misery in hell. And even though you're saying, as a disembodied soul after death, the soul will know where he, he or she will be for all eternity, um, that public manifestation at the end of the age called the general judgment, that will be made manifest to, to everybody and to all creation, yes? Yes. So there, yeah, there, there, mm -hmm. there will be, um, yeah, that, that whole, whole idea of, of this uh, particular and general judgment, that it, your idea of judgment is, uh, is a challenging one for people, I would say. Uh, I understand that it's very challenging for them. But you have to look at this in different fashion, in different ways. I mean, one is that you can't really separate the reason for this uh, judgment, as you've already been indicating in a way, has to do with the words love and freedom and how they work together and that, um, you know, our, and God loves us infinitely and he wants every one of us with him forever. And he will do, you know, it's obvious that he would do anything he could because that's what the crucifixion is about. And he that has, yeah, and, and that has nothing to do with though, whether we end up in heaven or hell because God loves all. It's how we respond, right? We, well, let's put it this way. Yes, I mean, the Lord wants everyone. He loves us infinitely. Yeah. And Yes, he wants us to open the door, say yes to that love of his. He, he, he desires it so strongly. It's a, it's a, it is, so I would say that in order to resist that, so the, the challenge is this, God's love is so infinite. At the same time, though, precisely because he is infinite goodness himself, um, the freedom of the human race is, 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 is there. It's a great gift, this gift of freedom. But, he, yeah. but God, because he gives us this gift, as somebody once said, he ties his own hands by making us free in a, in a certain way, you know, because, uh, you know, the, in other words, so because of freedom, human beings have to, in some way, they, they must choose this infinite love. We have to choose it. And, and because, uh, love, de love demands that. Love demands and, and, it, and it's not freedom. as it's not as difficult as a lot of people think. All you have to do is say yes to God and, and live according to his will, which he will help you to do. And you, you will say yes, and yeah. granted, you're yeah. going to fail probably every day uh, in living this out one way or another. And um, because the saints are very aware of that, their sinfulness, you know, mm. we fail constantly in living this out. I would, you know, I'd say, I would say, if we're, if we're really self-aware, we should be aware that we're constantly failing. <laughs> what, what, does scripture, and, uh, what does scripture say about the just man? Seven times a day he fails. <laughs> and, 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 and what do you... What are you going to do as a priest in about an hour? Are you going to hear? Oh yeah, yeah. I'll be hearing a lot of confessions. There you go. Yeah, that's so. There's the answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, at any rate, uh, judgment comes about because God, uh, God is infinite goodness, but He's given us this in His goodness this beautiful gift of, of freedom. It's yeah. a shocking gift, glory, astounding gift, and He loves it. That so that gift means that we have to choose His love. We have to choose His friendship over and over again because yeah. human being you know it's, it's, it's the way we are we're rather weak at it it's a living relationship it's not we're a living. one it's it's not a one shot deal i'll say yes today and then i'll just go do my own thing it's a living the beautiful thing daily about relationship that, a living relationship and the, and the beautiful thing about it though is that on his side yeah. the side of our, our heavenly father it's unending yes and uh unlike with other friends you know other friends you offend them that badly the way we offend god you'd think there'd be some sort of closure <laughs> but <laughs> right. with almighty god there's never never a closure there's always uh, this empty there he is waiting for us at every single second yeah yeah and that's why he because he made us in his image he asks us to uh love our enemies because he loves all and it's just a matter of whether we respond to that love and we should we should try to uh imitate imitate him in that respect he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. He won't just come again to judge the living and the dead. What does it mean? And this is one of those kind of almost slippery words that it's it's difficult to, to make intelligible. What does this mean, glory? He will come in glory. Okay, now that one's a bit, uh, he will come in his glory. Yeah. Well, okay, uh, we didn't finish the part about the judgment though, Paul. I mean, I was, I was slipping <laughs> away from your grasp. So, so particular in general, I mean, the particular right. judgment 
Yeah, it is a funny thing. How? Why do I get judged twice? Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> so I mean, it is a, the, the, the particular judgment. Uh, Boniface the Eighth said in his encyclical, his letter Benedictus Deus, that at the moment the soul leaves the body, you know, the moment of departure from this world, the person is immediately judged uh, and yeah, that, goes that, to the eternal reward. Can I just Either. say one thing? Uh, mm -hmm. It's not not the whole person, the the disembodied soul. Right. Right. OK. But, so yeah. the soul, the so, soul obviously separates from the body at death and is immediately judged by God. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, and goes either to heaven, uh, God forbid, the other place, eternal damnation or very likely mm. purgatory for, right. most, for a lot of people. Purgatory and for purification for their sins so they can enter heaven when they're ready. Right. 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 Uh, but there is a particular judgment. And it's, it's made at the moment we leave this world. And we have yeah. to be mindful of that reality. And I, my goodness. But then there's another judgment at the end of the world, which our Lord clearly tells us in Matthew 25. Right. Clearly, he's laid it, there it is. There will be a general judgment before all the nations. Um, there's something, um, you probably have some things to say on this, Paul. But I mean, there's something important, obviously very important there. The saints have told us because for number one, one thing is this, as I've already said, then every, we'll, we will see the interconnections between all, uh, about, between all things, how my vices or virtues, hopefully virtues more than vices, affected other people and brought about perhaps even their salvation. Oh, my goodness. Talk yeah. about glory, glory now, given to God, you know. That is huge. And we could spend so much time on just that one fact about how every single little action that we think we're doing in private everything affects everyone else and we there's something mystical and mysterious about that and and that will be uncovered uh, on that last judgment that final judgment will this will this judgment occur um after the resurrection of the body or while souls are still disembodied it's I, it, it, it would be it would be at the resurrection because people people will, be, will live in glory eternally body and soul or they'll be condemned in the same way right so so those who are that will be going to hell will their bodies will also be risen but it'll yeah. be in a, in a very ugly kind of fashion right yeah okay yes. so then let's get back to the word glory then because this is kind of um difficult to understand Jesus will come in glory to judge the living and the dead. And those who are risen from the dead will have for all eternity after that point, a glorious or a glorified body. So what do we mean by glory? Hello? A little bit there, Paul. Are you, um, are you there? All right. We had some technical issues for about 2.5 yeah, seconds here. and you are back. So back to the question, what okay. do we mean? What do we yeah, mean right. by glory? Well, I mean, the glory of God, I mean, would seem to be his majesty, his awesomeness, his beauty, overwhelming, overwhelmingly. And when we're raised from the dead, I mean, Christ is going to return in glory. I mean, one of the, one of the reasons that's said is because, um, Doxa is the word in Greek, right? Uh, yeah. and he, the glory of God in the Old Testament, you know, was in the temple. They experienced that glory in some way. His overwhelming beauty and power of God's of beautiful presence. Christ is going to come in glory because it's related to the fact that the first time he comes, he comes in such poverty and such a, like a slave. You know, he, he such uh, that's also beautiful, but he comes in such a littleness as a, ch a child. But now he's going to come an overwhelming beauty and awesomeness. You know, certainly like on Mount Tabor, you could say the yeah. glory of God was shining from our, our Lord's face, now, shining from he, his very body. But he will still come as a human being. Not, he not will come, a, he, 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 but yes, he, he comes as the son of man. He says the son yeah. of man will come in glory. Right, right, right. So then so his, can, his body will be glorified. Like he was on Mount Tabar, like uh, that's, that's one example. And, and his post-resurrection appearance, appearances, he was able to walk through walls, apparently, and, and do other things that, uh, that uh, he, he couldn't do before he was glorified and risen from the dead. Will the, um, will the glorified body of human beings be similar? Will we have those? Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, there's five characteristics. I don't remember all the five right now, Paul. Yeah, uh, but we can do that later on the, when at the end of the creed when we talk about heaven. Um, all right, so then um, he will he will send it. To, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. So this judgment, in one sense, is a recognition of our of our choices in life uh, and our ultimate choice of saying yes or no to God. I mean, you, yes, in, in, in a certain sense, yeah, that, it's true in a certain way. I mean, because uh, the Lord has, uh, you know, like some, somebody once said, <laughs> you know, if we say all of our life, my will be done. Yeah. Uh, God's going to have to affirm that at the end of our life. Well, your will be done. Yeah. And that will be a, a terrible thing to happen, you know, it, we to say, so, God ultimately yeah. respects our free will. He, reflect, yeah. he, he respects that. And he, uh, ref but of course, we have to remember that he's, you know, like Francis Thompson said in his famous poem about the hound of heaven mm. and uh, much more so. I mean, God is one pursuing us. It's not, that we're pursu it's not that we're pursuing him very much or sufficiently. He so, is madly pursuing these poor sinners because that's what the incarnation means. Yeah. And everything else about him, he's madly pursuing these poor sinners. He loves so deeply, infinitely. Uh, how, God forbid that someone should escape his grasp. Uh, you know, it should keep pushing the door closed. May, you know, so we, we pray that that won't, we pray to pray about that. We pray that all, no, I think a Christian should pray in this way. May no one shut the door. Please yeah. God uh, to him. But we have to say also as Christians, that you can shut the door. I mean, it's not that we can't. We're, we're that, able that, to. Yeah. That's a challenge. I mean, uh, it's, it's, but we, we, we pray and work that that doesn't happen. You yeah. know, we have to really pray hard. I think the saints did this a lot. I think they offer themselves as victims for that very yeah. purpose that nobody would do that. Yeah. Um, his kingdom will have no end. Does that mean that we will have no end? And how do we know? that we will have no end. We're not gods. Well, we're, we are simp eternal. So God alone is eternal. That means he has no beginning and no end. That's probably what eternal means. Right. But simp eternal means you have a beginning and no end. Yeah, like, an, like angels too. Like angels too. Yeah. And human beings are of that sort. And we could go into all that. It has to do with the nature of the soul and also the nature of human knowledge. It even goes into, into a th something called epistemology. Right. But we can show that the soul is substantial as a part. So in other words, it doesn't depend on the body or its existence. Right, right. Non-Christian philosophers have demonstrated that. You know, Plato, Aristotle, okay. sure, Socrates. Uh, so so there's there's been that constant belief that the, there's a spiritual component to the body uh, to the human being, and it's not it's not um, it's not composite, so that it can't decay or disintegrate like the body can, and hence it survives bodily death. That's understood, but this part about the resurrection of the body, which Jesus will come back in glory to judge the living and the dead, the dead will be raised. That has to have a divine, a, a particular supernatural gift in order for us to remain body and soul, glorified albeit, but body and soul. Yes? Well, let's, let's put it this way. That point about the body being raised is yeah. a scandal to the Greeks, right. as St. Paul would. That, that the Greek philosophers could not comprehend this. Because for them, the body was a prison to be escaped from. That's right. And here comes Christianity saying something quite amazing, that Christ rose from the dead in his human body and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. Yeah. Um, and that means the human body has astounding value, yeah. uh, both in this life and the next. Uh, because, you know, as you were saying, what does it mean to be human? It means to be a body person. And, and that's why this is so important, this general judgment, having the resurrection as a component of it, right? Because it, it makes human beings whole again. I mean, you, yeah. you, could, you could make the argument in one sense, even souls, disembodied souls who are in heaven with God are still anticipating their wholeness yes. um, in, with the resurrection of the body, which comes at this point when Jesus comes again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end, which means that we will be a part of that kingdom for all eternity, for forever. forever. Um, 
Okay. When we get to the end of the creed, I might ask you, what are we going to do forever? But uh, <laughs> like a little child would ask, but that, that's, uh, that's, that's for then. Any, any last uh, thoughts about this line of the creed? He ascended into heaven and, is, excuse me, that's the, that was last week. Um, he will come again to, in glory. Jesus will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. Well, it's a line that I love. Yeah, and, why? Um, why do you love it so much? Well, because for a number of reasons, to be human, we, we have to be goal oriented. Uh, we have to look at the goal. Human yeah. life is going somewhere. Yeah. And it, that's important to realize that my life is going somewhere. And I would say that Christianity gave that thinking to the world. My life is not a, a um, in other words, not in a circle, a continuous circle that no one ever escapes from. It's I'm going somewhere. Yeah. And someone. And uh, and that's be a beautiful human. Someone's waiting for me. Infinite. So how beautiful this is. In other words, for Christianity, it's all about homecoming. You might call it. it it's very interesting because before Christianity, it seemed like much of paganism, and still to this day, Eastern religion and philosophy, it does have that sort of circular kind of thing, of you know reincarnations, for example. There, that, there, there, there there's no. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, you go ahead. I think you were going to say something important there. Well, well, I was just going to finish it. You're, you're right. That Christianity has a, an understanding of the end or goal of human nature, which is to be in union with God. And that's why he created us in the first place. Go ahead. Yeah, we have. Yeah, it's important because, as I, as I said earlier, judgment is a key thing. And it's not a terrible thing the way it's made out to be sometimes even to our mind. I mean, yeah, there's something you could say terrible way <laughs> because, you know, you're you are. You, but at the same time, as I said, judgment, in other words, that life has meaning is what the word judgment really means. That's really what it amounts to. Life is meaningful. Has and, value. And if, if my life is a circle that never ends, reincarnation, for example, things like that. Well, then this life is not that meaningful. Quite right. honestly, but Christians don't see it that way. It is for all men once to die, and then the judgment. Letter to the Hebrews. And, and That's it, a, if we realize that, it's a very important. It's very logical that if if you understand that uh, if you understand what the end is, then you will be driving your car metaphorically in in the proper direction each day of your life to get to that end, which is you, which eternal life with God. Yes, you've got to keep your. You have to be aware of that reality in a in a, mm. in a in a beautiful, loving way that God is my father. He cares about me. He's waiting for me at the end of the road of my life. He's waiting for me and I'm running towards him. And I got to be careful how I run. I got to go straight towards the finish line and not get off course. There's a famous little parable, not mm. really, a little story about these three boys on the beach. And okay. uh, and uh, they, there's an old... An old an old man showed up there on the beach. And uh, so he told the three little boys. You there? We have a uh, technical issue. Hopefully he'll be back in a second. Am I back? And let's see. Yes, you are. Wow, we, we, we weathered two technical problems here. Let's see if we can get through it without another one. I think we will. Uh, so there was an old man on, on a beach, and there were three boys. Okay. And he said, young boys, I want you to run a run. Uh, we're we're falling off. Well, anyway, I guess that might be it. <laughs> Maybe the next time Father Blunt is on, we can get that story about the three boys. <laughs> uh, oh, wait, I hear you. I hear you. All right, really oh, quick, really okay. quick. <laughs> okay, so he said, the way you run this race is the winner is not the one who gets to me first. Yeah. The winner is the one who runs the straightest line. So, uh, you, know, me, you know, it reminds me of the tortoise and the hare. It's a little bit like that. But uh, so the old man uh, said, now go. And the three boys took off running towards the old man. And uh, the boy on the right was mm. looking at the feet of the other two boys. You see it? Oh, we lost you again. We lost you. You're listening to Beneath the Surface here at, uh, um, at Let's see, it's hopefully he will be back and it does not look like this time he will be. Next time we get on Father Blunt, we will hear the rest of that story. I am looking forward to it. I think you might be too. 
Thank you for joining us tonight. Great discussion. Thank you, Father, if you can hear us. If you can't, thank okay. you anyway. And, uh, than he was. and uh, are you there again? All I'm right. here now. Yeah, we, we didn't hear that story, but uh, I, I, I fear that we're never going to hear it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Do, do, okay. do, you want, do you want to give it another shot or no? I'll try one more time. All right, really quick. I might lose you, though. All right. But, by okay. the way, if I lose so, you one more time, uh, thank you so much for this. It was, it, was a, it was a fun, it was a good show to have. Okay, you're welcome. Good, you're welcome. Uh, the three boys, were, the old man said, so the, the boy on the right said he was looking at the other two boys' feet to see if they were running straighter than he was. Okay. So... He did not run a straight line. And the boy on the left looked at his own feet to see if he was running a straight line. And that and he didn't run a straight line either for that very reason. But the boy in the middle kept his eyes on the old man only. Ah. And never took them off and ran, ran a perfectly straight line. Ah, so the, the moral is uh, that's don't a look, figure of uh, Don't look at your own feet. Look at yes. look at the prize who is Jesus. And don't take your eyes off him. Don't look at I'm, anyone else's feet either. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Don't compare yeah, yourself to yeah. other people. Just keep your keep your eyes on the end. Keep your eyes on the end, which is God Himself, uh, fixed firmly upon Him. And then you will live the life that you are meant to be, and be judged well for Amen. that. Amen. <laughs> we got exactly. through it, Father Tony. Thank you so much. And uh, speaking okay, of Paul. speaking of judgments, um, have um, my wife and I are going to confession too today. So that's a. Uh, it's a really important thing. Oh, thank, good. Thank you for hearing confessions and thank you for being a priest. And thank you for joining thank us, everybody. Fun. Thank you for the, you've been listening to Beneath the Surface, number 15 in our series on the Creed Beneath the Surface. Have a great day and uh, we'll see you next time. God bless. See you, Paul.